this for me is the fact that I think sometimes we uh, take for granted how good this neighborhood is because it's one of the few places in the city that we can come together and we can have discussions on topics that are really, that touch a lot of us in a lot of different ways. And we do it respectfully and we do it looking for solutions. And to me, that, that's the best of all worlds. So thank everyone for being here. And one of the ways we get, we're able to do this is because, because I'm a, what, we're a very small chamber, and there's one of me, but I have some amazing board of directors and committee chairs. And so it is my honor to introduce you to Rick Keller from Keller Williams. He is the government Ad advocacy chair. Hi. Uh, uh, as Lynn said, I'm the government advocacy chair. and. Um, we're trying to become more of a conduit to the community at large so that the chamber can be a, more useful to the, to the entire community. And uh, when I came on, and, and before that, there was just all this tension around homelessness and people looking for answers. And so I thought this would be a way to start that conversation and see what usefulness we can get out of it. So I'm just going to go right into it and introduce Sola. And she's from the Department of uh, Human Services. Associated with homeless um, increases. So you can see 
again on this table, and I, I will just identify that this is data that goes through 2016. I think it's time for us to dig back into this data and, and revise it. But what we would continue to see for 2017 is ongoing increases. But what this means is that um, for every $100 rent increase, there's a 15% corresponding rise in homelessness. And this data comes to us from the Urban Institute, which has studied um, this revelation, I think, across many communities. Seattle isn't unique, but we certainly are following a trend of other West Coast cities. Another um, contributing factor is our ongoing opioid epidemic. So 35% of people reported use of harder drugs, such as meth, heroin, or crack. 45% also reported no drug use. So it's not true that every single person who is experiencing homelessness is a drug addict. Our REACH teams estimate that they are seeing about 80% of the people they encounter using substances. This data comes specifically from our navigation team. This is not our, our homeless outreach team's overall. It's specific to the navigation team, and I think that's an important caveat. Um, over 50% of people with opioid addictions in Seattle and King County are experiencing homelessness. Homelessness is outpacing the current provider system and current resources, and you can see in these photos examples of kind of the tragic environments that people are living in in our unsanctioned encampments throughout the city. I know that West Seattle isn't immune to this challenge. We show that through our one-night count that this continues to be a problem. I identified that with the rent increases. Our 2016 numbers showed that over 14,000 people were, had experienced homelessness throughout the course of the year. And the way that we gather that information is both a one night, the, the actual one night count where folks go on the street to enumerate people who are experiencing homelessness, and then we combine that data with who is in transitional housing and who are in shelters to come up with that combined number. We don't have the results for the 2018 one night count yet, but I anticipate it will likely increase. And last year's one night count was about 3,500 individuals sleeping outside. So there continue to be um, a problem with outpacing our resources in terms of connecting people to the services that they need. And I think the best way to articulate this is by looking at the bar on the bottom. We are able currently to house about 800 households um, throughout the year, which results in about 3,212 households being housed over the course of an entire year. What we would need to be able to achieve if we were going to reach functional zero, and functional zero is defined as um, effectively eliminating the experience of homelessness for anyone that you know is experiencing homelessness, and then being able to have a rapid response to anyone who falls into homelessness over a period of time. <clears throat> if we were to reach functional zero, we would need to house 3,212 households per quarter. So you can see that right now our ability to house 829 households does not meet the ongoing need of the 3,000 households that we would need to be meeting the needs of. Um, in addition to this, what we found when we interviewed people who were experiencing homelessness, they identified that they would move inside if housing were available and affordable to them. 68% of those surveyed would need help with rental assistance, and they, were also, they also identified a need for increased affordable housing. What we need right now uh, is an ongoing mix of the right options for housing. So you'll hear later from Paul, he'll talk about the development of permanent supportive housing. That continues to be an ongoing need. We need uh, to increase subsidized housing options. We need better access to Section 8 vouchers from the federal government. And we really need to work to unlock the private market housing um, stock that might be available to folks. So what has the city been doing? We did an analysis, um, well, we started doing work under the Murray administration in 2014 to look at what we needed to do to address the crisis of homelessness. You can see that we've gathered people in a variety of ways starting in 2014, obviously, before that, we were doing work as well. Um, through 2017, where we activated the Emergency Response Center, um, which was in operation all year during 2017 to address the needs of individuals. In 2018, we have refunded, I guess I shouldn't say refunded, but we redistributed funds to the homeless services system to help achieve the action steps listed below. So investing in what works, prioritizing housing for long-term homeless populations, 
increasing rapid rehousing resources, which is short-term rental assistance, and then aligning efforts to house as many people as possible throughout the system through our coordinated entry and access points. What we're doing now. So Pathways Home identified six key focus action areas. You can see on the table above what we thought were the most important aspects of the work to move people from um, housing to, from homelessness to housing. We, in addition to those key areas, have oper been operating six encampment villages, which are self-governed by individuals experiencing homelessness, with um, significant support from the city to provide staffing and operating costs and social services on site to connect people to the housing options they need and the medical, medical care that's required to be healthy. We have the navigation team operating. The navigation team is a combination of Seattle Police Department officers and outreach workers from the REACH program who work in coordination to go out and engage individuals living in encampments throughout the city and link them to safer alternatives, housing options, day center services, etc., as an alternative to camping, and then provide ongoing case management assistance to some of the most um, challenging individuals that they continue to encounter throughout camps in the city. The city also works really hard to store belongings, so when we, um, when we have the navigation team go out and they're disrupting camping at any particular location, they offer the option of storing people's belongings to make sure that we're not getting rid of valuable possessions. And then we're working to clean the city, and obviously this isn't a human services department approach, but as a collective, the city um, departments, including human services, our finance and administration services, and Seattle Public Utilities, along with parks, work really closely to coordinate efforts to clean the city. Better together, shifting strategies. So what we want to focus on in addressing homelessness primarily First and foremost is housing first option, so meeting people where they're at, providing person-centered services and getting them into housing as quickly as possible, developing an individualized plan, providing the support they need to be successful, and making sure that our system is integrated for results. So this is what we had, in, and we probably still continue to have, um, a variety of programs doing really good work to connect people to the resources that they need, but all of us really struggle to create a seamless system for people to manage from unsheltered through to housing. And so what we've worked with in a partnership with King County, All Home, and the, Uni and, uh, the United Way of King County is to come up with some common system alignment goals and housing targets to move programs to a more linear and discrete set of targets so that we can make sure that we're continuing to be laser focused on moving people from homelessness to housing. So you can see here that we've identified some targets, um, entries from homelessness, for example. We were seeing in 2016 that just 64% of clients coming into program into emergency shelter were coming from a literally homeless situation. We want to make sure that we increase that to 90%. We want to make sure that with the length of stay, um, in 2016, the actual length of stay was around 55 days, and we want to make sure that we're get, reaching a target of 20 to 30 days, people staying in emergency shelter and then moving to housing. And the exit rate to permanent housing in 2016, we had an exit rate of 9.6% of people leaving shelter and getting into permanent housing, and we want to increase that to 50 to 80%. You can read the, the rest of the numbers on this slide, but really focusing on, on honing in and in, increasing performance. So this is a little bit about funding, and this this stale I will acknowledge right now is this slide is stale. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> um, United Way, King County, and City of Seattle in 2016. You can see the amount of money that we were investing in programs. Um, just between 2016 and 2018, the Human Services Department budget has already increased from 30 million to 50 million dollars in general fund resources. So there are significant investments in addressing the challenges that people face today in moving people to housing. While the numbers on, the, on this slide and the former slide are stale, the funding is still allocated in these percentages. So the, the majority of our resources go to emergency response, um, emergency shelters, to day centers and hygiene centers, to navigation team efforts and outreach, other outreach efforts. While 30% goes to permanent housing, 10% goes to prevention, and 10% goes to services. And I 
think this might be my last slide. So the decline in federal funding is just something that I wanted to leave you all with because while I identified that the city general fund dollars are increasing significantly, our federal funds are decreasing and have been for several years. So you can see in this, I think the numbers are probably a little bit hard to read back there, but in blue are, demonstrates that 58% of um, the resources that we allocate to homelessness come from the city's general fund, while 42% come from federal funding. And you can see back in 2010 and 2011, we had a higher percentage of federal funding allocated to address the challenges. I don't see that trend changing anytime soon. The federal dollars that we get come from HUD, and there is no indication that we'll be seeing um, additional allocations from this administration. I have time for a couple questions. So, uh, Lynn, can you grab the other mic, please? of affordable housing. 
Um, I think that Paul can probably speak to some of the programs that they're putting online to really help that are based in um, best practices around housing first, which is the kind of primary focus that we want to have on, on getting people connected to long-term housing options, and then looking at how we design our rapid rehousing services, again, short-term rental assistance for folks, how we provide um, as limited of a, of a allocation of resources as possible to a household to help them end their homelessness. We're showing in that program that about 85% of the clients that we serve are able to retain stable housing a year following a, a brief intervention of cash assistance. So I think that we're, we're we're really working hard to figure out what it is that we can do to support people who have experienced homelessness. But one thing that I would identify is that homelessness um, really is the, the, the finest sieve in the safety net that there is in our community. So when all other systems fail, mental health, substance abuse, child welfare, um, mm -hmm. other aspects, lack of, of job growth, um, access to employment, when all of those systems fail, homelessness picks up um, where people fall through all of those cracks. And so we have some really complex challenges that, that I think we have to overcome in order to better address how we keep people from falling through that safety net. I saw a hand over here. Yeah. Hi, um, so my question is about affordable housing. So I always thought that the law in Seattle was when, um, with contractors when they were building apartment houses, they had to provide so much affordable housing in that building. So what is considered affordable housing when a studio goes for $2,000 a month or $1,800 a month in West Seattle? I mean, even like, you know, an $18 an hour job, which is considered starting out with a lot of places, they're only making under $40,000 a year, and half of that is going to a rent on a studio. So, I mean, what are their options? I've been <coughs> told that they have to provide so much affordable housing, but you don't seem to see it. And if it is out there, it's definitely not being advertised. Those are really great questions, and honestly, I don't know that I'm best suited to answer them, um, but I will do my best, and then Paul, you should yeah. chime in if yeah. I miss something. I was, actually, Paul has a good idea. Was like, why don't we hold all the questions till everyone has their presentations, because yeah. there's okay. so much overlap here. Great. I think it, that's okay. a good yeah. idea. So okay. we, we can all get on stage and answer questions. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> great. Okay. We are flexible. I did something to the screen. <laughs> she did something to the screen. <laughs> Are these presentations going to be available so we can have some time with the slides? I'd be happy to share these with Rick and Yes. Uh, by way of background, as noted, I've been a um, housing and homelessness advocate for many years. Uh, 2016, I managed the Seattle Housing Levy Campaign. Um, and then, just for full disclosure, I actually work for the City of Seattle for a city council member. Um, I'm here in my personal capacity and not representing my council member's views, although I do see that council member Herbold is in the room, so I want to say hi to <laughs> council member Lisa Herbold, who is doing some amazing work on the floor. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit today about uh, the people that are behind the numbers that we just saw from uh, from Sola's presentation, you know, oftentimes in the city of Seattle, of course, we see uh, the, the the impacts of homelessness when we when we look around. We see tents on sidewalks or along the waterfronts or uh, in various green spaces throughout the city, uh, and we see the people. And oftentimes, you know, when we look at the news, we see some of the uh, some of the ways that our media likes to. Uh, sensationalize some of the folks who are experiencing homelessness in the city of Seattle. Yet I would challenge anybody who's in the room to take a look at uh, and count how many people you see on a daily basis or total. Um, and, and, you know, I, I throw out a number, say 200 folks, and of the 40,000 plus folks experiencing homelessness in the city of Seattle, that's about 5% of the people that we're actually seeing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, living outdoors. Uh, the majority of the folks who are experiencing homelessness, as noted, it's, it starts from a situation where somebody is working and loses a job, and because of our rental market, can't afford to stay in their home. They get behind on rent, uh, they get evicted or wherever it might be, and then a whole set of uh, issues come thereafter. Uh, what, what I've found in my experience working with people who are living in, uh, in tents or who are living in the encampments throughout the city is a lot of folks are wanting to get into safe and stable housing. 
a lot of folks aren't actually using drugs, and those who are, I actually have a little bit, of, quite a bit of sympathy for. You know, the uh, the joke that I've always said is that you know, imagine you know who here on a bad day after a bad day at work, you go home, you might have a beer, or in Washington, you can smoke marijuana. There we go. I saw one hand go up. And so you know, you imagine that that's that's self medicating. And imagine that the worst day of your life is every second of every person's living when they're living outdoors, for fearing of harassment of individuals um, against them, fearing of uh, police actions against them, or because they got a ticket or they got a trespass notice and were unable to show up to court because they didn't know when their court date was, they now have a warrant out for their arrest. And so this, um, the, the, the situation that we see in our city is a long uh, uh, way of folks being able, uh, unfortunately, being led into a spiral that uh, creates more and more uh, inability to come back from uh, where they're going. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, benefits, though, I think, in the city, and a lot of the folks that I've spoken with at uh, the Georgetown Tiny House Village, which was the last one I was visiting, are folks who are working full-time now. Uh, they're making minimum wage, but they're working full-time at, say, Bed Bath and Beyond, and they're taking the bus in every day, yet they still have that one component that they're unable to reach, which is finding a place that is affordable in the city of Seattle. Um, you know, I know that Paul will be able to speak to, to this a lot more, but I think that the, if I remember correctly from Office of Housing, the HUD numbers that recently came out suggest that the median income in Seattle is $108,000 for a family of four. And the way that we do rent restrictions in the city, it's based off of uh, area median income uh, for 60% of AMI, you get one set of rents. For 80% of AMI for the multifamily tax exemption, you get another set of rents. And then for zero to 30%, I think it's one third of total income, and um, yeah. Paul will speak more to that. But what we see is you have folks who are more and more likely to um, be unable to even afford to live near where they work or be able to afford to uh, get on transit to get to and from work and maintain that employment, um, leading to, again, losing a job and, again, continuing to be in home, uh, experiencing homelessness. A lot of folks that we uh, see that we are trying to help are people who are actually now starting to accept that support and accept that help through the navigation system. Um, I've spoken with officers who are saying that now when they go out and offer somebody uh, a place that's in, in a 24-hour enhanced shelter, they're taking it because that's something that works for them. Um, this goes into the whole idea of where we reach low barrier shelter as a model as opposed to some of the historical uh, ways that uh, homelessness was addressed, which is uh, the proverbial mats on floors where somebody goes in and they have to be in by uh, you know, 8 p.m. and then out by 6 a.m. and nowhere to store their belongings. And for a lot of folks, that's not something that they're willing to do. They have to be separated from their partners or separated from their pets, and that's not something that they're willing to do. And so they choose other options in order to survive uh, in the city of Seattle and survive near their families, survive near, uh, near, near their friends. The, what, what we didn't see on the, on the, on the uh, HMIS or on the uh, uh, point time count data sheets was something that came out last year, 2017, that showed that 91% of people experiencing homelessness in King County are from the state of Washington. 77 or 78% are actually from King County itself. That's a huge number. These are our neighbors. These aren't people yeah. who are coming and moving to Seattle just to get our, quote, services, end quote. And so whenever I hear folks talk about free Seattle, that's actually not a real thing. Um, uh, the, the reality is that our services are incredibly maxed out. And as we're seeing more and more decline in investment from the federal government, that makes it a lot harder for people to actually get the services that they need, whether that's housing or the uh, uh, general health care, mental health care, which causes greater and greater slippage into uh, more and more uh, situations where it becomes more difficult to provide the services necessary to get folks into the permanent housing that will help them be successful. And I think I've actually read a story on Curb just yesterday of a woman who uh, was a counselor at a school and, due to a job loss, ended up living in her car uh, for months. And she was living in a Mercedes SUV um, because that was the only place that she could afford. And it was her last belonging. It was the only thing that she had left until she was able to finally um, get into uh, living on a couch with a, with a family member until she can get back up on her feet again. And this is the reality for a lot of people that we see who are outdoors um, and who are living outdoors. Uh, but there's something, there's a lot that we can do. You know, we hear a lot of the direness of it and, and the, 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 the sadness associated that we see, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing that we as people can do. And that's where you get to the politics of homelessness. Um, you know, again, I think uh, I live in East Lake uh, right next to Cairo Radio, and so Dory Monson, uh, he's a fan of doing various stunts, and recently he set up his Dory Monson mansion on a sidewalk in our neighborhood to try to protest 
uh, homelessness uh, camping in the city of Seattle. But I, I, I feel like that doesn't actually reach to what the goal is that we're trying to do as a city. And the goal that I see when I talk to folks is that we want to be welcoming. We want to embrace and find ways for families and individuals to get indoors and to get that permanent housing. I mean, when I say families, I think that's an important component. Um, the most recent statistic that I saw is that one, um, there's enough children experiencing housing and security in the city of Seattle that, in every, that to fit one in every classroom of Seattle Public Schools. Uh, there's a cost associated with that as well. If somebody is experiencing homelessness, a family is experiencing homelessness, and it starts in Seattle, and they're uh, moved to, uh, to housing facilities outside of the area, their children still have to be calved into the city. So you and I are help, having to pay for that, which is not a bad thing. They deserve that, but that means hours of commute time to and from. Uh, away from their families in order just to be able to get an education uh, because of a lot of the services that we have are so maxed out that they can't reach all the families in need. But there's a lot that we're doing, I think, that was mentioned as a city as moving forward and the way I think that the business community in particular um, can be helpful in this is making sure that people know that these are folks experience, these are our neighbors who are experiencing homelessness and that there are needs associated. Uh, some of those needs are as simple as being able to access a restroom. Uh, who here has donated to a food drive or to a, a pantry? There we go. I mean, and, but the reality is when we're, when we're eating, there, there's the adage, everybody poops. And so there still has to be somewhere where, where people can do that. And this is one of the challenges that people face in the city of Seattle, um, is finding that opportunity. And so I think that you know, uh, uh, up in Greenwood, for instance, there's a lot of the small businesses up there that actually make sure that their restrooms are open so people can go to the bathroom. It's a basic thing that we all have to do and it's a way that we can help ensure that we're giving back to our communities, while at the same time um, keeping our communities clean. Uh, we don't, nobody wants feces on the sidewalk. The best way to do that is for it to go somewhere else. Uh, another uh, area that I've seen is with respect to providing ability for people to actually go and get a job interview. Uh, I was up at Queen Anne Helpline uh, for work a couple weeks ago. It's actually the same day I got this. And, um, you know, what they have there is a, uh, a clothing bank, and they have interview uh, tips that they give to folks who are seeking support. And Queen Anne Helpline is part of the, uh, the Helpline network. And so here in West Seattle, you guys have the West Seattle Helpline, which does a lot of similar work and is a great resource in our community to ensure that folks who are experiencing homelessness and are trying to get a job are on the verge of homelessness and are trying to avoid that, that there's a place to go and get that resource. And so um, if you have a storefront, it's a great opportunity to provide that information, because a lot of the information about where people can go is not as readily accessible as one might think. As the city moves forward, of course, when we're looking at um, additional solutions, uh, your advocacy for meaningful solutions that are going to provide that permanent housing and provide that support to prevent homelessness in the first place is one of the most important things that we can do as a community to ensure that we're going to be successful. It's a lot easier uh, and this is one of the things that I, I, I think is, is troubling to me as an individual. It's a lot easier to have screaming matches in public discourse, but that doesn't actually get us anywhere. And I find divides us more and um, pushes us farther and farther away from the ability to come together. I'm reminded of an interview that I did with Cairo uh, Radio uh, with uh, Sarah Lerner a couple of years ago, where I actually met with somebody from uh, the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood Safety Alliance, which was an organization sprouted up in North. Uh, West Seattle to um, combat homelessness from an angle that I don't necessarily agree with. And this woman and I, we actually sat down and we talked and it, and it came out to a, a position where when you're not yelling at each other, when you're seeing eye to eye and listening, the reality is that I believe we come to better solutions. Everybody wants to feel safe in their communities. I want to feel safe in my neighborhood. I know that everybody wants to feel safe in their neighborhood. And that doesn't matter if you're homeless or not. Everybody deserves to feel safe in their community. Sometimes we might need to feel a little uncomfortable in our communities, and that means um, not protesting, but instead embracing when um, a permanent supportive, ho permanent supportive housing project comes into our neighborhood, for instance. Because what we see is when that happens, our neighborhoods thrive, and the individuals in those communities thrive, and we, we become a better city as a result. So this is kind of um, a little, that's basically the gist of my uh, yammering today, is to really think about all these numbers that you're going to hear about are people. They're individuals, just like you and me, and just like you and me, any of us can become homeless. And I say that on purpose because I have been before. You know, as a teenager, I lived in a shelter for a brief period of my life, and I believe that that's why I've come to this uh, uh, 
angle at seeing this issue in our city is that it can happen to any one of us. And with the support necessary, if we are able to provide that, anybody can come out of that situation, come out of that extreme poverty, and do well with themselves and do well to give back into their communities. And that's the one ask that I would have of all of you, is to continue the work that you're doing on advocacy in a way that continues to push forward that advocacy that's in a human-centered approach, recognizing that all the folks experiencing homelessness, the 4,000 plus individuals sleeping outdoors, the 15,000 plus people who are um, experiencing housing instability in shelters or transitional housing, or the uh, 25,000 plus people who are severely cost burdened know that we are going to keep them in our hearts and work to try to ensure that they are taken care of as members of our community. Thank you.
here to Seattle and they meet with our partners from everyone from Columbia Legal Services to um, Apple Healthcare and um, the Office of Homeless Youth, which they advocated for and got, um, to discuss the barriers and issues that they're having. And um, this year it was particularly striking that um, a lot of the issues really did relate to homelessness and prevention of homelessness and the things that young people need to be um, uh, stable and independent adults. Um, think about when you leave foster care um, and have to go rent your own apartment. Um, nobody issues a credit card to you. They don't have parents who help you establish credit or who will be willing to co-sign for you. Um, these young people really, really struggle. Um, a few of the wins um, that we've gotten lately was the Office of Homeless Youth, um, which is doing a lot of great work around the state. Um, they're involving young people in the decisions that they make from that department. Um, last year, we passed, um, for the first time ever, a driver license, driver's license bill for youth in foster care. Isn't that the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard, that we have to pass a bill to get access to driver's licenses for kids in foster care? Um, you know, granted, in Seattle here, we have a great metro system, um, but we don't have that in every part of the state. We had young people identifying taking three to four hours on buses to get to school. Um, and then how do you get to work? Um, I mean, transportation, I know a lot of folks think of it as a privilege, but um, in this day and age, um, it, it really is a necessary component of being able to transition to adulthood. Um, another piece that our young people worked on was expanding the Passport to College Scholarship Program. Um, there were young people in foster care who've been excluded from this support for higher education, including youth in tribal foster care, young people who've been placed in foster care here from other states, and um, young people um, ex uh, who've come over as refugees through foster care systems. Um, so they advocated for the inclusion of those young people to be able to access these critical supports. And one of the great things about Passport, and this is one of the solutions out there, is there are contacts on campuses, on college campuses, to be able to support young people with all those things that, that they need to keep, to keep going every day and getting to class and getting to their degree. Um, and then, uh, lastly with that, they also advocated for and um, got from the state legislature the inclusion of unaccompanied um, homeless young people to be able to receive that scholarship support as well. Um, and we're going to hear a lot of other things today. We've already heard things, you know, there are a lot of things that go into homelessness, but I would say education, and I don't just mean a four-year liberal arts degree, um, vocational education, um, certificate programs, but that is a key factor for success for um, children and youth experiencing foster care. Um, so that, I'm going to move over to our family programs. Um, I don't know if folks are aware right now, but we have a crisis in this state and in this nation around our child welfare system. Right now, there are children who are sleeping in motels with social workers because there is not a foster home for them. They spend their days in offices. Our local child welfare offices are designating office moms and dads uh, to, to, to sit with the kids because there's nowhere for them to go. Um, I know I sound really preachy and moralistic about this, but these are children. There are children. These, there are children. There are children. And there are not enough people stepping up wanting to do foster care. Um, we have um, develop, developed an innovative program at Mockingbird Society um, called the Mockingbird Family. And it's really quite amazing and simple if you think about it. We place a veteran foster parent in the center, geographically, of six to ten foster homes in a community. 
um, to provide all kinds of support um, for those foster parents to be able to navigate the system and, and work with the children and young people in their care. Sort of a community within a community. Um, one of the biggest things we see in the churn in foster care is, you know, kids are having behaviors because they've experienced incredible amounts of trauma. And foster parents are kind of left out there on their own to just kind of figure it out. Um, and what uh, the Mockingbird family allows us to do with that um, uh, hub home parent, uh, that veteran foster parent in the center, they are able to provide emergency and planned respite for foster parents, um, which is absolutely huge. Um, and they bring together the, their foster care community once a month for a community dinner. Um, and they bring training into their home. Um, it, it is really quite an incredible model. You have a couple here in Seattle. We're in. Um, uh, we're putting up three new ones in Kent, Pierce County. I think we have nine up and running now. Um, uh, but you know, you're you're never. Excuse the reference, but you're never a prophet in your own land, right? Um, uh, it's it's this has been going since 2004 here in Washington State, and we're only up to 18 constellations, is what we call those groupings of families. But the UK um, has decided that um, Mockingbird Family is the way they're going to deliver foster care. In their first year of operation, they had 20 of these constellations going, and in the next year and a half, um, there will be about 50 across uh, the UK. Um, and, and this is the primary way they're going to deliver foster care services. Nobody can do this work alone. We need each other. Um, and on that, um, I will just, uh, just share a little bit of personal information. Super excited about this work I get to do because I grew up in foster care and was one of those statistics of people who aged out of foster care in New York and ended up homeless for a while. Um, and, you know, there, there are so many things that go into surviving the foster care system and surviving poverty. And the two things I would, I would uh, like you to take away from this is, number one, mental bandwidth. People look at folks living in poverty and they think that they're lazy. The hardest working people I know are those people who are living in poverty. I mean, imagine having to do all the mental gymnastics just to keep yourself going for the day. Um, where am I going to sleep? Where am I going to store my stuff? Where can I take a shower? Where am I going to eat? Um, you know, am I going to have a safe place? Am I going to have to worry about, you know, the police taking me in? And then am I going to get fines that I can't pay that keep going? I mean, folks work really hard um, to keep themselves afloat. Um, and we need each other. So, I'm going to go on to uh, talk to you just a little bit about um, student homelessness. As I said, this is hot off the presses from the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. Um, we uh, at Mockingbird embrace a different definition of homelessness than HUD does. Um, we go by the um, definition for the McKinney-Vento program, meaning that, um, and often legislators will ask me this, was well, that the number of people who literally have no roof over their head? Um, and I have to say, no, but these are people who don't have a home. Um, so we look at the nighttime residents of public students, uh, public school students across the country, and this is 2016-27 school level data. Um, and our partners at uh, Building Changes in Schoolhouse Washington kindly let me uh, this data to share with you today. 73% of students um, are, are experiencing, of, of our students experiencing homelessness, um, are doubled up. And that doesn't mean you live with a friend and you've got your own bedroom and you guys are kind of sharing expenses. It means that, that people are, are living together in the same places because they don't have a choice. Often children are sleeping on the floor, parents are sleeping in recliners in any place that they can find. Um, six, another 6% six of those experiencing homelessness are children, um, are sleeping in hotels or motels, 14% uh, in shelters, and 7% are unsheltered. That kind of feels like a crime to me. Yeah. 7% of children experiencing homelessness literally do not have a roof over their head in the state. 
So these definitions do matter. Um, and there is a lot of conflict at the federal level, and I'm sure nobody wants to hear all the gory details of that. Um, but for, for HUD, um, they only count folks who are in shelters or folks who are unsheltered as homelessness. And in some instances, a hotel or a motel, depending on who's paying for it. So if the government's paying for it, it counts. If you figured out a way to cobble together the dollars to get a hotel or a motel room, it, it doesn't count as homelessness. Um, it's why we at Mockingbird prefer the US Department of Education definition. Um, for uh, students experiencing homelessness, this is just a breakdown um, of the federal dollars um, and how they come down into our state. We have 295 school districts in this state and only 41 of them are receiving funding right now to implement um, the homelessness requirements. And I think Michael uh, referred to it earlier. Um, we know that kids need stability in school. Um, that is a huge factor to success. We have independent school districts um, that don't have the same requirements. Um, and so McKinney-Vento says that we need to bus um, or cab young people to their school of origin to keep with that continuity. Only 41 of our schools have funding to be able to do that. We call it the unfunded mandate. And I'm just going to kind of move through these sites quickly so we can get to our next presenter and then do questions and answers. Um, Washington has made some significant investments ourselves in um, uh, public funding, and you can see the list um, there. But you know, you add another 12 and another nine to the 41, we're not even halfway uh, to covering our schools um, that, that need the support. So this is just a map, um, and the, the little grid here, I'm not sure if you folks can see it, um, the darker it gets, obviously, the, the bigger concentration, of, um, concentration of, of homelessness. And if it's that really light color at the very bottom there, the number has been suppressed because there's, um, it could be personally identifiable. Um, so those are some of our smaller communities. Um, statewide, 3.5% of all of our students are identified as experiencing homelessness. So if we look here, um, you can see that um, it's fairly distributed across uh, age and grades. And then we see a sharp rise um, for young people in their senior year of school. Um, and we think that's because a lot of them are turning 18. Mm -hmm. um, parents may not be able to support them anymore, um, and, and they're going out on their own. Um, this is also a disproportionality issue. Um, this impacts, and I just want to be clear, um, the, the purple is um, uh, students, uh, students that are housed and the, um, uh, within that ethnic or racial group. And then the blue is um, the percentage who are, is that right? I don't think I have that right. I'm gonna move on from this one. I think I've got that wrong. But what we do know is, is that African American um, young people, uh, American Indian, Native American folks, and um, uh, Hispanic and Latino folks face the highest levels uh, dis of disproportionality in homelessness. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend here from Plymouth House, if I can find the escape button here. There we go.
South Lake Union downtown on First Hill. But some of the information that was already gone over, some of the questions I know people had, I want to make a few comments. One is when we talk about this number right now of 14 to 15,000 people who are homeless and who's out there and who's homeless, and that number is throughout King County, um, we do that point in time count every year. I've been with Plymouth 25 years. We started right out of high school. Um, <laughs> and um, we've been doing the one night count for many, many years. And what happens with that is that organizations like Plymouth, through our volunteers, our board members, our residents who go out and our staff to go out and count, we have certain sectors in the community that we count every year. So we get to know that area, we know where people might be sleeping and might be camping and things like that. The one thing we've noticed in the last five years is car campers. So when we talk about this issue of homelessness, the folks that we serve, you're going to learn about in a minute, that number has gone down somewhat. But the fact is, because of the cost of living in Seattle, the rent increases a whole bit, we're seeing more and more people drop into homelessness. I've never seen so many car campers um, in my life. And that's people that have just dropped out of our, our rental market system, people that are working day to day, and that's a big part of the numbers of increases. I played tennis at Amy Yee, and I had a really late night match a few weeks ago. And I was I was amazed. I was driving home at 11 o'clock at night, and down MLK, where I drop my daughter sometimes at Garfield, take her to school sometimes. And all these campers and cars were lined up along MLK. Obviously, they had gotten permission somehow to go there late at night, and be out in the morning because they never see them except coming back from tennis late at night. So it's a real issue. So I just want to say, when we look at this number, how big it is, a lot of it is whether it's what um, Sola mentioned as far as $100 increase is 15%. That's pretty accurate, but no matter what the case, it's a huge issue right now because of the cost of living in Seattle. The other thing is we talk about the Housing Authority and we talk about Section 8. Do people understand what Section 8 is? A voucher. It's a voucher that's going to help somebody with their, with their rent. So they're going to find an apartment, let's say that's $1,500 a month. The Section 8 is going to cover most of that rent. The person moving in there or the family will pay 30% of their income towards rent, and the voucher picks up the difference. But people have a misunderstanding to think that a voucher is a number of units. A voucher, the Section 8 program, is a pot of money. So when someone asks a question about other cities and how it's going, we were compared recently to Houston, and it kind of ticked me off. Because the cost of living in Houston is not that high. Right? We kind of compared to Utah, about the issue in Utah. Utah. And um, <laughs> our homeless crisis here is bigger than the whole state of Utah. And the rents are pretty low. So when we've seen these rents go up in Seattle dramatically, the, the voucher itself is able to go higher also. The income of the people it's serving has not gone higher. So that, that gap is huge that we're paying to, the, to an individual or family that we were paying 10 years ago. But the pot of money is the same. And the other one, I have a couple of lists here. The other misnomer out there is, um, and it was in the press recently, the city of Seattle is spending more and more on homelessness. And Sola had a very good slide on there, up there. The fact is that the federal government has reduced funding over the years. So if you take the fact that they've reduced funding and thank God the city of Seattle has picked up their funding to meet the need, besides that, the cost of living and the cost of everything in the last 10 years. So Seattle's helping to pick that up too. So I give a lot of credit to the city of Seattle. I want to say too, Councilman Herbal's here, you are really lucky. If you're here because you care about the issue of homelessness, you have the best council member out there. And not just in her time in council right now. I worked for her for many years and her time working for Councilman Lakata, big advocate of homelessness. So thank you for being here, Lisa. All right, I'll get on to the homeless now. Thank you. <laughs> So like I said, we have 1,000 residents in 14 buildings um, throughout downtown and surrounding neighborhoods. And this is who we're housing. So people, um, our men and women, we work with single adults. Our mission started that way to really work with chronic homeless single adults. A quick story is we were started by Plymouth Church, which is down at 6th University. They found folks sleeping on their doorstep. They wanted to do something. They went into a building where the lusty lady was located <laughs> downtown and had housing above, and they went to those owners and they took over the housing and they fixed it up and they moved the guys, men and women, on their doorstep um, into that housing. And then they immediately realized people are homeless for a reason, and there's issues, and they spun off into Plymouth Housing Group. It was a great start of our organization. Um, the average of the folks that we serve, their average income is $8,400 a year. And that's basically by some form of disability, whether it's our veterans on VA, it's our people with mental health issues or other issues going on, Social Security for our seniors, that's the average income. And so again, in our housing too, people are paying 30% of their income towards rent, okay? Those disability checks have not gone up most, much over the years. So the cost that we have to do to raise money for the service we provide and the rents and the property management has gone up. The income of the, of the resident has not. A lot of people also um, have fallen through our systems, especially I want to speak about homeless veterans. Um, the VA does a wonderful job in many ways, but it's a complicated arena to go through. Same with the mental health system. So we have people coming into our housing with zero income. 
So we're charging them zero rent, but we want them to have money to live on. So immediately our social workers are working with them what their issue is. Sola had a slide about self-determination of why I'm homeless. Mm -hmm. And the one that's sort of low there in my mind is mental health. Because no one's self-identified that I'm mentally ill. They're just not. But we're noticing it as they come in. And so we're getting people assessed whether it's from mental illness or it's a vet who's been off the rolls of the VA for many years. We're getting them back hooked up to all those services. So eventually, most of our people get on some form of a disability income, um, but that's not always the case when they first move in. We have, so we have 56% um, with mental illness, 87% have some form of disability, 49% are seniors. We did, a few years back, a seniors-only project um, really to, to put the services geared towards those seniors as the baby boomers are aging. Um, so it's the homeless um, people that are homeless in our community. And so we wanted some specialized services for them. We're actually planning another senior building too. And then addiction. Addiction is really a, a big issue with everyone. Um, many of these things, if you add that up, it's about 100%. Many of these overlap. So people are self-medicating. There's all sorts of things going on. Um, and then the other thing I would say, um, we also operate a program that goes back to that Section 8 issue with um, HUD. We operate a program called Shelter Plus Care. I hate the name. It's not shelter. It's actually housing. Um, it's another 1,200 units we have throughout King County. And what we're doing there is it's a federal program that we operate similar to a housing authority. We are finding landlords that will work with us. We are providing the rent subsidies. The, the residents are paying 30% of their income. These, again, are all people with mental health, chemical dependency, some veterans chronically homeless. But they're people that are a little more stable, that can um, handle living in an apartment with services visiting them, versus our model in our buildings of people having 24-7 care. So we do both of those things. And again, we would be do, we used to do a whole lot more units throughout the county with that money, but again, it's a pot of money, so the rents have gone up to be able to serve less people in that program. Does that make sense? Okay. We're serving a lot of people, thank goodness. Um, so services leads to disability. So our model as 24-7 is we now have a coordinated entry system in our community with the county that evaluates people's needs as an assessment tool. And the highest need people are coming to Plymouth, one, because we are provided, provided with the services necessary to work with those people, and it's our mission. And so those people are coming to us. So in order to take folks with multiple issues, we have a 24-hour front desk in our buildings. We have individual support by the case managers and social workers. Every one of our buildings are working with people with multiple issues coming off the streets, but everyone has a little bit of a twist to it. Is that a professional term, a twist? Um, <laughs> I came to this work working with people with AIDS. I too grew up in the foster care system, although I landed at eight years old with a really good family to my family today, so more power to you. Yeah. Um, and um, when I was working with people with AIDS, um, I went to Plymouth and I said, hey, you have housing, I have people in need of housing, I have services. At the time, Plymouth wasn't providing services. We just didn't have like apartment buildings. This is again, 28 years ago. Um, and so we did what's called a set aside. They gave us 10 units. We moved our clients in, and I have social workers there every day. And the model really works, because the fact is, some of the systems out there in mental health, the VA, and all these things, they're responsible for these clients. When they get into Plymouth, they kind of turn it over to us in a way, because they have other issues going on, and they have other cost issues. So we're happy to do that, but we want to hold them accountable to what they're being funded to, for, too. So it works out really well. So every building might have a set, our senior building has a set aside with the VA. So there's 40 veterans in that building, and they provide additional services, have a captive audience of their clients that they can serve better. It works out really well. Um, but we do in the intensive services. What is housing first? That term's run around. I really, the housing first term, it irritates me because it's kind of new. It's like the last couple of years, right? At least we all hear about housing first, get people into housing. We've been doing this for many, many years. So is organizations like DESC, Catholic Housing Services. We all get it. And the idea there is to say, if we expect people to change behavior, to get better, to stay on medication and things like that, how can we expect that when someone's living in a tent or in a shelter that's being put into a shelter at 10 o'clock at night, not 6 in the morning, roaming around the city? So the idea is let's get people into housing. That's the carrot. That's the fix. Housing first and we'll deal with their issues. We can do that because of our model of the 24-7 um, desks that we have and on-site social services and property management. So we um, house most anybody coming off that waiting list, single adults that are coming into the system. And again, mission is our mission, but we're also capable of doing that. So it's basically low barrier, people need a stable home first, and no requirements for change. And we get that a lot. Um, Michael mentioned it. So um, I get the question a lot, so I'll, I'll answer it now before you ask it. Um, are people allowed to drink? Do they do drugs? What's going on there? And I said, well, it's housing first. They have a lease. They have an apartment. I say, you know, one night I was at home enjoying a glass of wine, and someone knocked on my door and told me to pour it out. 
Well, that didn't happen, and it's not going to happen here either. So we're addressing behaviors. People need to be respectful of their neighbors and things like that. But once we get them into housing, all of those issues are taken care of over time. But it's basically an individualized plan for each person about when that can happen. So saving lives, saving money. So um, Lisa will remember this. I keep referring to you. Council member. Okay. Um, uh, I, a number of years back, there was talk about needing to build a second county jail because we had an overcrowded jail. So the story I tell here is that I'm in a coffee shop one night. It's raining in Seattle, believe it or not. No. A person who's homeless on the streets coming in all wet, starts screaming, I have warrants, call the police. Barista, everybody didn't know what was going on. I got up, talked to them, we called the police. The police came, I talked to the police, I went back to my friends. People came over and said, what just happened? Well, this, they looked it up. This gentleman was shoplifting, um, and he was arrested, and he was told to show up for court. So although he never did, no one's looking for him, he technically on the books has a warrant. So he was turning himself in. Why? So he can be in jail for three days and get medical attention, get fed, get a good place to sleep, and go back on the streets. And this was sort of this revolving cycle, especially around people with mental health issues that were disruptive in our community. So what we did along with some other nonprofits is we sort of developed a kind of mental health court and gearing people like this into permanent housing versus having them go in and out of our jail system. And lo and behold, we've never had to build a second county jail, and hopefully never will. Um, huge cost savings to the community. So saving lives, saving money is of the medically compromised. So on the right-hand side there, you have Plymouth on Stewart. This is the historic St. Regis Hotel downtown that we were very honored to be able to save from demolition. Um, and we had a, a program going on there. Another nonprofit did. We took over the building. We did about a years-long renovation. And during that time, we know that our model saves money. But sometimes you need to prove it with a study and go to the University of Washington and pay for it. Anyway, I'm joking around, but we did this great program at the University of Washington and mostly Harborview, but other services too. And here's what we did. We showed that in 12 months, we identified 29 high utilized homes, high flyers of these services, especially the emergency room. We tracked with the University of Washington $2.4 million of public cost with just 29 people in 12 months before entering our housing. Now, these people had issues, like I described with our clients. They had medical issues the whole bit. They moved in, and the next 12 months, the cost was $585,000. And this was not, this $2.4 million was not covering every single possible cost. It wasn't necessarily doing jail. It was doing things like sobering center, right? It wasn't tracking the cost of officers to pick these people up and take them to the sobering center. So this is really true cost savings, so over $1.8 million. I went to Harborview. I asked for my money, and they said no. <laughs> Because they have their own problems, right? Um, but it's, it's, it's showing that with permanent support of housing and people that are chronically homeless out there, getting them into housing, even though some people think it's a costly model, it really isn't compared to the cost of having people out on our streets. And it's also the right thing to do, right? So um, lo and behold, Plymouth on First Hill. This is our newest building. We just opened our 14th building. Um, it's above City Hall on 7th and Cherry. And this time, we went to Harborview and we said, so remember this great study we did? Um, we're going to do this again, and you have a huge issue right now, again, at Harborview. We say, oh, we're doing a great, great organization, great workers there. You know, it's not just Harborview Medical, but it's a psychiatric unit. It's everyone there at Harborview, they have a lot of social work we're working on this issue with us. They've been a great partner for many years. So we said, we're going to do this building, and let's do this set aside again, like we did at Plymouth on Stewart, and let's do 30 apartments. And they jumped at it, right? But this time, you're going to provide nursing and some other social care on site on your dime our time as a community. But they said okay, and it's, it's working really well. So we have a full-time nurse in that building, not only providing nursing care for those 30 people that are in those set-aside units, but for the whole building and other care workers, and it's a great partnership and we want it done in the future. And this is another um, point of evidence around the cost savings we can do if we all work together on this issue. Um, seniors. So again, um, our this is our Lang and Ann Simon Senior Apartments down on Third Avenue, where we work with homeless veterans. In our pipeline, I'm going to talk about in a minute. We have the need for more of that. Um, there's really key specialized services. Every unit is accessible in the building. Um, we have different um, laundry facilities on every floor. We've learned from this model how to effectively work with seniors. But the fact is that the issues that people have had, and um, a funny story about this building is, whenever we do a new building. We have seasoned staff, and our staff is amazing working with these folks day in and day out, 24-7. We have seasoned staff move open to open a new building, and then we have the new people that we hire. Um, it's always good to have that mix. When this building was opening, staff came to me 
although I said talk to the director of housing, I have no control over this, but they really wanted to go to the new senior building. And I'm like, oh, sure, sure. And after it was open for the first few months, and you had to imagine, when you open up a new facility, it's 100% of folks are coming directly out of homelessness. As we work with people over time, we have a unit turnover, we can bring people in, it's manageable. But at first, we have a little more intensiveness going on that first year. The building was chaotic. And the staff came to me and they said, you knew, didn't you? I go, yeah, but you're a really good person. I want you to be there. And what it was was we were dealing with seniors. We were dealing with seniors who, some of them homeless more than 25 years, in and out of other systems. Um, there's a slide solo had up to these long-term stairs in shelter. This imaginary thing that people, some um, people feel like, well, all they can handle is a shelter bed. They can't handle a permanent place to live. Um, we got a lot of folks in this building with a shelter, a women's shelter had closed down at that time from redevelopment, and we were able to get women that had been in that shelter for 10 years into our housing. But these folks, especially the vets, for instance, had a lot of issues. Um, so it was a very, very challenging building because they had been in and out of homelessness, dealing with multiple issues for many, many years out in the community. So what's next? So um, we're really excited. Um, we're going to break ground soon on a new building that's fully funded. Um, in part, and thanks to the city of Seattle and the International District, it's at Rainier and King Street near Jackson. We're working with the neighborhood there. On most of our buildings are mixed use. Um, the downtown buildings, especially, are required to have commercial. So we put commercial in there and really work with those tenants too on our mission. And um, this property is not required to have commercial, but the International District is losing a lot of commercial tenants from redevelopment. So we're going to put commercial in there and work with some of the ones being displaced. So working with that neighborhood right now, we'll have a little bit of a mental health bent uh, set aside on this building. Um, the next one, it was really challenging. Um, we are going to do the first high rise, um, and hopefully this will get a lot of recognition for Seattle nationally too and try to do more of this. We, this is a sound transit site up on First Hill, also near medical. This is where our seniors are going to be. Um, it's a high rise site, high rise being up to 16 stories. And this is a site owned by Sound Transit. And with advocacy from Councilmember Herbal and many other council members and a couple of mayors, it's been years in the workings. Um, we were able to get that site awarded to us from Sound Transit for free. They did not have federal dollars. Yeah, they did not have federal dollars in there, and so they were able to make the decision themselves of what the cost would be. So what we what we presented to them was 300 plus units working with another nonprofit to deal with our affordable issue, Bellwether Housing, who does housing for low wage workers. And so we're going to do a mix of homeless seniors and workforce in that building for 300 plus units. We're very excited about that. The other building on the right. Um, 12th Avenue at Spruce Street. This is an amazing organization, a small organization. It really reminds me of Plymouth Church's, um, how they started Plymouth Housing Group. They have a facility up on 12th and Spruce. Um, they have a building that's falling down where they do um, services for homeless. Um, St. Francis House, it's called. And they have homeless folks come in. They might give them backpacks, give them food, give them sleeping bags. And what we're going to do is, um, in exchange for the property, it's sort of like buying the property, but instead of having a set sales price, we're going to rebuild their facility on the ground floor of this project and do 95 plus units there. So we're really, really excited about that. And hopefully more to come. So, is there one more presenter or are we back up? Well, uh, apparently not. <laughs> oh, that was the, that was the police. Our, our, our I can do their part. So, <laughs> it was as SPD had been invited to come, and they, uh, as you can imagine, their attendance was conditional uh, of what else they were doing today. Um, so, uh, first of all, I just uh, want to say thank you. <laughs> so you guys came on this beautiful day to give this presentation for us because I asked. The phenomenal. Thank you so much. So, can we do some Q&A? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You want to just hang out over here? Yeah. We can go to the here. Pass the, pass the mic. Hi, I'm uh, from BCA West Seattle Veterinary Hospital. So, of course, my question is about the animals. Um, I pass by every day um, the exit 164 from 5 to 90, and there's an encampment there. It's horrible, um, and the, the conditions are deplorable. I don't know where they're using facilities, but I did see a pet there, and I'm wondering how the pets fall into that. You had mentioned that they don't want to go into shelters because of their pets, so I know it's about the humans, but I'm concerned about their welfare because it they don't have their, their pet, then a lot of times that's emotional support for them, too. Uh, so 
the city of Seattle uh, knew that this was going to be a significant challenge when we looked at redesigning shelter systems for um, people who are living in encampments. So one of the things that we did with the Navigation Center is make sure that people can come in with their partners, their pets, and their possessions, um, and make sure that those pets are adequately taken care of. We worked in partnership with the Seattle Animal Shelter when we were activating the Emergency Operations Center to see what they could do to provide additional support. And they've, um, I think, done a couple of different pilot programs where they've looked at how they can make sure that pets' health care needs are being taken care of. Um, the Navigation Center isn't the only facility that allows pets, but we've also got our, all um, six of our encampment villages also allow people to bring in their pets um, and make sure that we're providing effective health care services. I think that it will be an ongoing challenge because you're right, those animals living with their people in encampments are definitely seen as family, and we want to make sure that we continue to build projects that will support that ongoing need. So it's not back to the question I asked before, I don't need that, thanks, about uh, affordable housing. So the fact that, like, you know, when builders are building, like, you know, we see all this stuff in West Seattle, I don't see any affordable housing units going into these apartment buildings that are going up. So what is going on with that? Is there any kind of affordable housing? Is there a system there that am I misinformed as to what I think is there? Well, a couple of things. So I mentioned our partnership with Bellwether happening right now with that high rise. I think there's Bellwether. Capital Housing, there's several organizations that are doing the more affordable units versus the homeless units that we're, forming homeless units that we're doing. So that's going on. I'm not sure which ones are going on in West Seattle. The other thing is that we um, have been working on the um, MHA program with HALA to do some upzoning in certain areas. And the idea there is that people, and I've been pretty impressed with the number of um, for-profits that are going to build those units versus just paying into a fund for us to build the units. But I know some of that's going on. We also continue to have the multifamily tax exemption program, which is a program that's been very effective for many years where uh, a developer, and I'm sure there's many of those in West Seattle already, where the idea is that um, the developer for at least 10 years and then can renew is um, um, forgiven of citywide property tax kinds of things. And in lieu of that, they build some affordable units within their building. Then, yeah, I mean, so specifically on the MFTE, it's uh, 20 to 25 percent of the units have to be set aside for individuals making uh, up to 80 percent of area median income. So it's considered, um, considered workforce housing. So, so you, and this is where you get to the weeds of the affordable housing uh, conversations is that you have that. The MHA program is specifically set for folks at 60 percent of area median income. The housing levies uh, serves people up to 30 percent and then up to 60 percent. Uh, and then there's the employee hours tax uh, proposal that's before city council right now, which will uh, really focus again on that 30 and 60 percent where we see the greatest need in the city of Seattle. Um, there's the other question I heard you mention earlier, which is how do people know about it? Um, Office of Housing does maintain a list of all the buildings in the city of Seattle that are supposed to be um, complying with these rules on, with the on-site performance, and there's also uh, incentive zoning in certain parts of the city um, that, are, that are supposed to do that. There's also some conversations. Um, I know in at least one of the council members' offices about trying to really activate that to make it more easily uh, searchable for individuals who are trying to find more affordable homes who do fall into those categories of 80% or below area median income. But uh, we're also not going to lie to you in a way of saying, and you're not doing that, I'm not saying that, but it, the need's great. The need's great at every level. And so like Bellwether, for instance, we work with them you know, on this project. They, everyone has pretty long waiting lists, too, for these affordable units. We definitely need more of them. I mean, I grew up in New York, so it's like there was rent control. Jersey. And, yeah. But the thing is, you had diverse neighborhoods because of it. Yeah. Uh, it's like we were losing that here. I mean, it, it, there, if you haven't, like, you know, uh, for me, if I didn't buy a house 10 years ago, I wouldn't be able to live here. <laughs> right I'm now. I'm the same boat as you. Yeah, so, yeah. It, I mean, that's what it comes down to. But, it, I mean, there's, you hear, like, rumblings about rent control and things like that, but there's nothing being done about it or nothing really being said about it or nothing that is keeping our neighborhoods diverse or the reason that we were in West Seattle to begin with is this used to be a blue collar community that was where people just, they felt at home and, and that's disappearing quickly. There's some law against it right now. Yeah, so the, the, the big issue. On the years against rent control in Washington, not to out speak, but and the low income, they're 3% mandatory and now they're taking parking away in these big huge high rises. Where do you think people are going to park? Everybody who owns a $500,000 condo has a Prius, has a Tesla, has something to drive on Sunday when buses don't go where they are going to go. That's not a solution. I, I would like to know what's the percentage of people that are transitioning out and then opening up spaces for more people. I mean, probably in Plymouth there's less people transitioning out. People that, right. Yeah, right. But, I mean... So the problem is growing, but are people leaving the pipeline? 
So let me. I did talk up there in the presentation, but I'll give you an example of as we as we look at our growth now and the projects coming on board. We're going to do another project like I'm about to describe, and um, and um, we already did one that wasn't in the slideshow, but. So the idea for us is that, yeah, people in permanent supportive housing are there for the long term. And I was trying, I was going to make the point about because of the issues they've had, they can't even get in nursing facilities. So we have hospice coming and things like that. But a few years back, we did a project. It's kind of a graduation project. So after people are on a medication, things are going well, long term, some, we have 1,000 units, about 10%. Are able to live a little more independently, but there's nowhere for them to go. So we open a building. We're going to do another one that has um, a little less low barrier. So basically, it has one social worker in the whole building and a property manager, not 24/7. And we graduated people to that, and that's been a really effective model. We want to do more of that because, again, it's not just the building of construction, but it's the operations of the buildings. So what we're able to do there is move that building has 70, move 70 people in that building from our other permanent supportive housing, which freed up with no additional cost, freed up 70 slots to move more people off the street. So we'll be doing more of that for the homeless and extremely low income. But the other workforce units, as evaluations done over time, and if people's income increases, their rent will increase. And in some, some cases, they're not going to necessarily leave, but as their rent increases, they may then have more flexibility to move to a different apartment, like a market rate apartment, um, and leave the low income unit and make that available for other people. But again, I, real quick, there's not enough of any type of housing right now. And, and this isn't the big global part of the question that, that you're asking, but um, we see a lot of our young people who come to work with us at Mockingbird Society start out in homeless situations. And I am proud to say under the last two years, every single one of our young people who work with us are housed. Um, it may be you know, a transitional uh, housing type situation, um, but they're all housed. They're, you know, we're able to pay them enough that they can actually afford to be a good roommate, um, and they're all actively pursuing some type of educational, um, educational something. Drop in the bucket, right? We have six young people at headquarters, and you know, 15 elsewhere. I can talk a little bit about throughput from a kind of more global perspective, but what we're able, what we're seeing now. You guys hear me without the mic? Yeah. Okay. So what we're seeing now is that about 40% of people leaving emergency shelter are able to access permanent supportive housing. Um, I talked a little bit about the number of people that are retaining stability after um, a short support um, instance with rapid rehousing where about 85% are able to remain stable after that short-term intervention. Um, just in terms of context, I think it's important to understand the volume of people that are living unsheltered, that are attempting to access emergency shelter, um, the small amount of transitional housing that we continue to have available, which we have been slowly reallocating to other services, and the permanent support housing that we have available, there are roughly 12 units that become available on a monthly basis. So we are, we are far outpacing um, the demand versus the need at this point, which I think is really important to just underscore Paul's point that affordable housing continues to be the, the most driving, the most, the, the, the biggest challenge. And that's, I think, where we also see what we, if you have an opportunity, if you look at the Housing, Health, Energy, and Worker Rights Committee, had a special meeting about a month and a half ago about the housing gap. Um, that's where we see that over 25,000 households at 0 to 30% of AMI that are currently in the market are paying more than 50% of their income into their housing costs. Um, something like over 10,000 households that are between 30 and 50%. And so it, you know, it goes down, but you still have these huge amounts of folks um, that are doing that. And if we were to actually uh, pay as a city to provide all the housing necessary um, for all of that at about $300,000 per unit of housing, which is typically what the cost tends to be, um, it would be something like $5 billion. It would be the entire city budget for a year, assuming that we have no design review or people pushing back against development of housing. Um, that would be how much it would take to actually do it all at once. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of people are, um, have a misnomer about transitional housing. Transitional housing can be anywhere from six months to nine months to a two-year program. And then if you're not housed, if you don't have a very um, – aggressive, uh, skilled worker that can find you a place to live and help you do the applications and things like that. Um, getting into housing, there's people with barriers, 
whether it be felony, whether it be um, domestic violence or a type of assault charge, even if it's a, a misdemeanor assault, there are certain barriers with all these housing agencies that those people can't be housed. I'm seeing the same women in these emergency shelters, and I do some volunteer work and have some experience and some legal advocacy everywhere. And they, they're the same people from five years ago. And 20 years ago, it took eight years to get Section 8 on a list. You had to wait eight years to get into Section 8 housing as a low income person. And some people um, were able to, you know, save it off and get in maybe quicker if they lost their job or something. But it's no longer like that. It's a lottery for, for people who um, are most desperate. But there are women in wheelchairs, in the women's ones that I see, women in wheelchairs. There's people with drug addictions. There's people that come from the jungle some nights when it's really cold or they don't have a tent or a buddy to sleep with, whatever happens, that they're not being given services. There's not these, there's a disconnect. And the public who are paying taxes, and some of those homeless people that have paid taxes, there's a huge disconnect and nobody's plugging it in. They're attempting to, and some of it works and some of it doesn't. But transitional, people end up back on the street again after they have their time in the transitional housing. If they're lacking the, the life skills, they can't keep their kitchen clean. You know, they have friends coming in that bring bugs in or they bring bugs in because they don't have life skills to clean, cook, whatever. Yet they're getting housed in apartments, which could be housed for somebody who has a job because these ladies lose their job because they can't catch a bus back from working a night shift or there's nowhere to shower at midnight. Apparently the shower place up on 12 um, that was supposed to be 24-7 apparently only is supposed to be catered to those living in tents and that the sweeps affect. Somehow there's some barrier with that as well. So there's a lot of things the public doesn't know and they may not even know as people in social work housing. And then the flip side is a couple weeks ago in the Seattle Weekly, there's a huge um, disadvantagement or taking advantagement of people who don't know their rights legally. There's not enough legal advocacy in eviction prevention or working with people who lack skills or have addictions or accountability for them to see social workers and social workers can't solve it all and counselors a lot of times go into counseling because they have their own issues behind them. So some of these things disconnected and keeping people housed. The veterans do a really good job. You're, you're absolutely right. But, the but veterans while we have our they do a really good job but it, even veterans under their 24 months are not housed. Right. And they're homeless. Do you have a question? I'm so Tiny houses. 
all of the villages, to, and I think one point of your question was that all of the villages now have tiny um, sleeping structures and are we're taking the tents out of the equation and really just making sure that all of those sleeping structures are hard sided. Volunteers currently build all of those tiny sleeping structures. Lehigh doesn't have to pay for the infrastructure to, to acquire the materials, but volunteers donate their time. I think Vulcan just had their entire office shut down to build 50 uh, about two weekends ago for the women in Whittier Heights. Um, I think that the dispersion throughout the city could be, um, it's, I think, still not really defined by this current administration, and it's harder and harder to find available land to move the sites to. Um, so I think there's lots of conversation to be had about what this administration wants to see happen. So they're not considering permanency where they're at now? No. Okay. I do know there are some sites, such as the one um, yes. in Lipton Springs and the one in Othello, where the owners of the property are affordable housing developers and are going to develop that for permanent housing yeah. um, as soon as the money gets cobbled together, which you can talk right. a lot more about the cobbling together of money. Yeah, so it's a good resource right now. Um, what, we, what we try to do, as many nonprofits have, and I talked about our projects coming up, I can't do all those tomorrow. And so the idea is we're trying to work with city funds and other funds to tie up property for future development, and some of those are a few years out. And so that's why many of the nonprofit center are making those available for the tiny house villages or other things that don't require the process that um, Sol is talking about. And so it may, it may last longer than two years, but probably three years at the most to get the, the site then to redevelop. Is there anything um, specifically being done um, for youth who are homeless? I noticed with Plymouth, there was a great deal of senior housing and different things like that. I'm wondering, what are we doing to get young people who are out on the streets? Um, kind I of think the main organization working with that is the YMCA and um, Youth Care. And maybe Sola can explain. I don't know what they're doing Yeah, right but now. that, if, I've just met, is there any of these housing developments being looked at? I know a lot about that because I, I do work in that field. Any of these housing units, any of these buildings being turned over to, to um, places that w will help young people get into houses? So there, I know that there's one that's being done up on Broadway across from a uh, neighbor's nightclub, uh, a youth and a collaboration with youth care, and I forget what else involved, speaker shops then. I see Central on that one. College. I see yeah. Central College. Uh, and then up in New District, for instance, there's yeah. actually a great uh, a collaboration done between Lehigh, uh, New District Food Bank, and Youth Care to um, uh, build this really this fantastic building, which has uh, housing for folks exiting homelessness um, who are adults in the top two floors. Um, the second floor of the building is all youth care, so it's all folks in that 18 to 25 year old range, I believe is what they're serving on that, that, on that site. Is that the 50th? Um, yes, yeah. just up the 50th. And then they have the food bank on the main floor, cool. so you have uh, some of that services provided. And then what's actually really neat about that is there's also a street bean espresso right there, which is a really great program right. um, that provides training and job uh, skills for young people experiencing homelessness. And all the numbers that I referenced in, in the slides that we were going through include all investments across all age groups, okay. single adults, families, youth and young adults. Thank you. So in the interest of letting these good people go, I'm just going to ask you each one question and answer it just go. What, as concerned citizens, what is the most productive thing you think we could do? Either as an individual citizen or as a community or as a business owner? Depending on what, do you want me to start? Sure, please start. Depending on what um, kind of fits your fancy, I think there are a lot of ways to get involved. I think being here is huge. I think taking this message and sharing it with all of your friends and family is another aspect that's really important. And then practical involvement could look like volunteering with any one of the organizations that are up here today um, or understanding a little bit more about how you can gather you know, resources for a community food drive or support services for, not support services, but things like socks and underwear and hygiene products and things like that and donating them to, a, to an advocacy organization um, are really important. And you feel those things that actually do tangible good? It's yes. not, it's actually for the people, not yeah. just for us to feel like we're doing something? No, I think that they're really beneficial. Right. The other thing is to give an undesignated gift to any one of our nonprofit organizations so that they can use it in the way that best meets their needs. Yeah. And um, I, 
I, I'm not speaking on behalf of Mockingbird for the first part of this answer, but we have a revenue, this is my personal opinion. I don't know where the recording is going, but this is not the opinion of Mockingbird. We have to talk about revenue in the state. Whenever, um, you know, schools got funded, and that's, that's fantastic. We need good schools. But when schools win, social services lose. Um, and there is a limited pie right now. And we have to have some real hard conversations about how, how we fund our state. Um, I, I'm not going to give an opinion about it. Um, but um, the, the second thing is, is I think we really do need to reevaluate our social contract with one another. Yes. Um, children should not be sleeping in motel rooms with social workers. You know, and you may not be able, you know, everybody's heard the commercial, you may not be able to be a foster parent, but anybody can help a foster child. It's true. They're in your neighborhood. They're in your schools. They're in your children's schools. You know, make sure that it isn't pay to play in your schools so that kids in foster care and homeless kids can participate in those things that other kids do. You know, be willing to provide respite to a foster parent where you take care of their children for a weekend so that they can get a little downtime. Um, you know, there is Treehouse where you can donate things to their, to their warehouse. Um, and then I'll say, you know, the advocacy of young people matters. So at Mockingbird, you know, we can always use volunteers. You can come make dinners for our chapters or for our foster uh, constellations. Um, you can help support us. We don't take any government money until recently, just a little bit, to develop some training curriculum, but it's limited. Um, uh, we, we, can, we can always use the support. So I'll touch on two things, and not totally related to what I do at Plymouth, but one is that state issue. Um, I didn't mention this in my talk, but imagine um, we think about Seattle, our area, and the state as pretty you know, progressive and liberal compared to other states in the country, yet we are like 47th of 48th state when it comes to mental health funding. Mm -hmm. It's an atrocity. And we, yeah. That's a state responsibility, and it's been cut and cut and cut, and that's why we pick up the slack so many times. So when you hear about things going to the state, advocacy is really important at that. The other thing is that um, our current mayor and council members are gung-ho about this issue and about affordability for all in this city. And so think about ways to support their efforts, because we have a lot going on right now that we want to see more um, both requirements and funding and things going on. And like this gentleman mentioned here, really, I totally agree with you. I bought my current house 11 years ago. Yeah, and, um, you know, taxes are even hard, but just affording, thinking about somebody else, my son coming back from college and trying to buy in the city is unbelievably impossible for a very long time. So we want Seattle to continue to be a place for all at all levels, homeless folks that we serve, formerly homeless folks I call them, um, to low-wage workers a whole bit, and that advocacy is going to be happening a lot over the next five years, I think, um, and we all need to get involved in that, and that's for every community in Seattle. I think the number one thing is to remember that we're talking about our neighbors, we're talking about people. Um, these aren't something in a pie chart somewhere, these are actual individuals who uh, are, could be your brother, could be your sister, could be your parent, could be your child, and that when we're moving forward with revenue streams that are really focused on providing uh, uh, services that we know work, it's important to support them, I believe. Um, we'll, of course, hear from some groups across the city that, you know, Seattle spends more than anybody else on homelessness, but as uh, Solo pointed out, we're spending more because the federal government continues to cut. We're spending more because the state government continues to cut. Uh, so hold your legislators, hold your elected officials accountable, and when you hear misinformation, feel free to fix that misinformation. There's some things you could do on the advocacy side, especially here in West Seattle where you have an open Senate race. Make sure that the people who are running know that we need to ensure that we are fulfilling the promise, not just of education, but of foster care. Um, the Bronx settlement still is not fully funded. This is a, a settlement with the state of Washington from the early 2000s about foster children and how we treat foster kids. We're not fully funding mental health care, as we see um, out of uh, a Western State Hospital. It's not just the funding of the beds, but it's also making sure that we provide adequate wages for the people who are working there so they will continue to work there, so they can continue to live in our communities. What you can do in your own neighborhood, I think everybody up here has uh, pointed it out, make a contribution to something that we know is uh, to an organization that's working directly to help folks experiencing homelessness or prevent it in the first place, or pro uh, provide support for families who are in need, uh, West Side Baby, uh, West Seattle Helpline, uh, the West Seattle Food Bank, you have so many amazing resources in this community. And when you do donations of food to food banks, don't donate uh, 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 expired food or something that you wouldn't eat. Think about, <laughs> would you eat it and then, and then donate it? Yeah. Uh, 
Oh. Or donate money because they can they buy it by hundred. Yeah, they, yes. They get a better rate. Yes. And so, th um, and so when you're doing these things, make those contributions and be welcoming of your neighbors. Remember that we're all people. We're all in this together, and we all want a better community. Yes. So if you can if you can only do one thing a day, you know you see somebody on the street who's obviously struggling, look them in the eye and say hello. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So we have the space for a little bit longer. If you guys want to talk amongst yourselves, feel free. I have Thank I have a you, my friend. You need to say we got five more minutes. I had a question. I'm dying to Go ask. For it. Can oh, I still ask? Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Actually, it's a comment and a question. Uh, as a retired teacher, high school teacher, I'm very impressed with Mockingbird, especially uh, the transition into some type of technical college. South Seattle Community College has uh, working with local high schools where kids get to go for free. I think that's fantastic. Uh, also, as a Union Gospel Mission volunteer, uh, I'm really impressed with what you're doing with permanent housing because those people all need permanent housing. 99% of them would love to have it. Uh, every person, 98% of the people that we see at night, uh, that we give things to, uh, blankets and sandwiches and water and everything that they, they can use, they're so grateful and so thankful. But here's my question. I've got a new best friend, and his name is Gary. And he lives across the street. I live on Harbor Avenue. He lives across the street in his van. And he, I met him six years ago. And he and his dog, Princess, live in the van. Uh, he has no uh, chemical dependence issues. He's 57 years old. He lost his home. Not by any fault of his own. Uh, and he would like to have a job and some place to live. And he has no computer skills. And nowadays, looking for jobs, you don't go to a, a Costco and say, here, hand me an application. You apply online. He doesn't have those skills. I've been trying to help him, and we haven't been successful. So I'm asking, what would be your advice for helping him find a job in housing. Is there a list that he can sign up on, that he can be on a waiting list for housing? Is there any type of <coughs> job opportunities that yeah. he could get through the city? There's two local companies that are interested in hiring people who are homeless or recently recovering from homelessness, and that's Recology, which is in this area. Are uh, interested in, it, it would be a heavy labor job, so you would have to be physically able to do, meet the demands. Yeah. And the other is UPS. And the way to get with them would be to call both of their government affairs professionals who have been in touch with the city of Seattle and say, I have a person who's interested in Did you say UPS? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's very good advice. Thank so, we'll, and then two other ones. So, short term job placement might be going down. Um, Belltown has talked to me at the Millionaires Club. So the Millionaires Club is doing a lot of um, temporary jobs, day, day, not really heavy day labor. You talk about just jobs out there that some of those turn into permanent. Yeah. And then also in the food industry, there's Fair Start, um, who does a really good training program. Same, yeah. Yeah. Job with day labor too, listed, we, we two and one has lists, no. and I just know of those two off the bat because I've been trying to talk to them. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does everyone here know about two one one? Sorry. Please call 211 um, if you or someone you know is in need of emergency services. It's really the crisis line is what it's known as. But 211 is a great clearinghouse resource to find out where there are food banks, where there are shelter, where there are clothing services, um, other crisis care services. They have a list of every available resource within the city of Seattle and can connect people to those services. It's also the way that you access um, most, if not all, of our current housing resources if you're experiencing homelessness. So that's your, that's your number one takeaway, and I, that was my final part, was, it for, was that 211 number. Yeah. That is the lodestone. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.